Welcome everyone to a new episode of Perf Bites. So uh, first of all, as you can see, I am not alone with the senior performer. Someone, there's two uh, other new people, new guests, and uh, not new people. You probably have heard of them. Uh, they have been out there being doing a lot of crazy stuff. Uh, and it's very excited to have this episode, which is going to be uh, like a Christmas gift from Perf Bites on what happened during 2023. So I'm very excited to have several uh, Leandro with me. So how is your perform? How are you? Hola, everybody. Happy holidays. Happy soon to be New Year. And I hope you all had a very happy, eventful, and full of learning and performance 2023. Very happy reporting from Berlin, Germany at this moment. Exciting morning to be Christmassy and holiday and all that. And uh, we have uh, a friend of ours that was with us in the Whopper. And uh, also, uh, yes. you're, you're doing quite a lot of podcasts now, Almo. So, hi, Almo. How are you? <laughs> blame Leandro. No, this way. <laughs> blame Leandro. He's, he's the one to blame. So, yeah. Uh, Almudena, hello. Uh, felices fiestas from Spain. Uh, reporting from Barcelona right now, and uh, happy to be here with all of you. Such an honor to be here. And last, we have a good friend of ours that was uh, that showed several times to the Performance Advisory Council when, at the old times of Neotis, uh, and he uh, launched since then a very popular uh, podcast, the Slight Reality Injuring Podcast. So it's Stephen. So hi, Stephen. How are you? I'm very good, uh, enjoying uh, the the summer, Christmas and New Year here in New Zealand, which is probably quite strange for people in the Northern Hemisphere, but I'm used to barbecues and hot weather and going to the pool at this time of year. And today is like such a scorching day. I'm in a garage now, not so insulated, and it's just like so warm and hot right now. It's, it's fantastic. So. It's it's funny because I was I was just uh, burning some woods uh, just to to warm my house. So uh, it's the completely opposite uh, at the moment, uh, at least on my end. Sounds like we need to do these special episodes over that side of the world. Sounds uh, beautiful, <laughs> Stephen. I'm so jealous. <laughs> mm-hmm. We could do a, a load of the ring uh, because he he's very close by. Uh, the Obits uh, part. I don't know how. The, what's the Obit lands? Obit. Uh, Hobbit Hobbit land. Yeah, oh, come on. Yeah. We were actually planning a Hobbiton trip with the kids this summer, but wow, oh. it's it's so booked up. It's it's such a huge thing, and so many people still go to it and travel around the world to come to it as well. So, so is, is it like a theme park, or is it like a you just you, you just uh, stay there, or what's the what's the? It's like a you, you do tours, as far as I know. I've never done it, and they show you around, and you get to go into Hobbiton and see all different things, and they 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 talk about what. Show you everything and explain it. Um, my wife actually did costumes in Lord of the Rings, so there you go. Mm, okay, interesting. What are you going to be dressing like? What character, Stephen? Well, we haven't got a booking yet, so I'll probably just be in, in my swimsuit going for a swim. <laughs> <laughs> but New Zealand is amazing in general, so there are so many places that you can visit. So it's yeah. amazing too. It's the one of the best uh, country I've visited so far. So most beautiful country I've visited, for sure. This episode is brought to you by the New Zealand uh, Tourism Commission. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So oui, oui. what about what happened during 2023? So that's that's the good, good the big question that uh, we t- will try to answer. Um, and uh, I think uh, Stephen, uh, Almudena and Leandro already uh, had some topics in mind. I have a few topics, just uh, that I will try to uh, more moderate this episode than, than bring uh, assets. But I, I like to speak, so I'll probably add some, some, some stuff in the middle of the conversation. So let's start. So Almu, so what, what happened this so year? For me, um, I work in retail in, in Europe, in one of the biggest ones in Europe. Uh, 2020, 21, 22 was... Um, Huge growth, um, mindlessly, that I was like a headless chicken going around just uh, making things grow and effective. And uh, 20, the, the end of 2022 and uh, 23, it was like establishing just uh, reducing costs, uh, just uh, adjusting budget. Um, Kubernetes was like uh, really 
in the house already, just a set of uh, Kubernetes. Um, and then the, that meant for us like uh, to question if performance engineering was um, significant. If there was an, uh, a reason why we should be still doing performance. That was at the start of 2023. Then we have a release and th then it was shown that we already, <laughs> we still needed performance engineering in the house. So that was uh, uh, my 2023. It was open telemetry, Kubernetes, and just a budget uh, adjustment. So, so, so to to transitioning to Kubernetes. Uh, I mean, we talked about it during the Whopper, but it will still be good to to, to remind it to all, all the people listening here. Um, transitioning to Kubernetes forced probably your the team and the organization to change how they're going to test or deliver performance compared to the uh, usual bare metal environments. So could you share that, that story to, with us? So for us, when, uh, well, we have like uh, three different verticals. Each of the verticals is have a different way of uh, dealing with Kubernetes. So we actually have to change as well the methodology between the different verticals. Um, one of the things that we did was like uh, changing to to K6 um, to have um, with the operator. Uh, so we have a um, broader way of uh, testing uh, performance instead of uh, virtual machines with a uh, meter or Locust or Gatlin or whatever. We just have an operator, Kubernetes operator within uh, with uh, K6. Um, but the methodology was like, uh, what are the, the validation criteria that we were like having? It was not now like uh, uh, how long does it take for us to get the capacity or how long does it cost for us to run, uh, how many instances are we running? It was like, uh, we need to reach here. Our validation criteria is like, uh, we have to reduce costs. Kubernetes has to be like half of the price that we are paying for Azure. So that's one of our validation criteria and it was the strongest one, I think. <laughs> so driving performance and cost in the same time. Yeah. So Kubernetes for us, the drive to for, to to go to Kubernetes was a cost reduction. That's uh, mm -hmm. one of the things. It was not the reliability or the elasticity. You have that uh, with um, the hype, web apps. Just the hype, or just yeah, it, I'm, I'm I'm running Kubernetes. So go do oh, oh, oh. fancy <laughs> dinners and say, hey, you know, man, I'm a yeah. Kubernetes operator now. <laughs> <laughs> that's I think that has a bit of it. But uh, for, for us, it was. Uh, uh, the 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 budget actually, and and it reduced a lot. It was like uh, we are down to I think we are down to forty percent of what we were spending before. Oh, wow, so it's impressive! Was, it's a huge, a huge but, improvement. But but sometimes when you when you start operating in Kubernetes, you, you the first reaction is to to over provision and yeah. you don't optimize so much the node. So did you go through first being inefficient and then? Uh, start to say now we have to do some changes and, and optimize our environment. Yeah, I think our first product it was completely inefficient. <laughs> at some point, actually, we have to rebuild it <laughs> because it was like, uh, well, we were learning. We were just like, but it was like end of 2022, and we were starting, and we didn't have actually no one in the in the staff that knew how to deal with Kubernetes. We were just learning and uh, doing the stuff, so it was completely inefficient. Uh, so by the end of 2022, we just uh, hire a guy that it's uh, um, uh, really well uh, in the community, um, in in Kubernetes in general, and uh, he helped us to build properly all the all the environments and all the products. And since then, we just keep hiring people that knew a bit a bit more knew a bit more about Kubernetes at that point. But the, yes, the first one, it was completely inefficient. <laughs> it was like a huge um, failure. But um, well, in uh, then you were gradually, continuously growing. You didn't just jump yeah. everything like a uh, no, we, we, we were like uh, POCs. It's like we have three verticals, well, four verticals. Three of them are like uh, um, to the little plus app. So they have users uh, behind. That's uh, where we started. and. Um, there were like three ways of 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 doing Kubernetes. There is still there are still three ways, of, different three ways of, of dealing with Kubernetes. One is a platform. The other one is that uh, one cluster per product. The other one is something else, completely different. Uh, the three of them. Um, to, um, so we just started testing things. 
um, different products because Kubernetes is not only Kubernetes, it's all the ecosystem of products that you have around that is, okay, now I need a uh, service mesh, now I need Likrd, now I need uh, <laughs> Dapper, it's, it's now I need... <laughs> it's a Lego. It's just fantastic. Yeah. You open a box and then you find, oh, there's tons of bricks and then you have fun. <laughs> yeah, you have fun. That's that's it. You have fun. You start t testing things and breaking stuff. And that's yeah. always fun. And sometimes you're sweating and say, what the fuck happened here? <laughs> <laughs> and you start chaos engineering. That, that's even more fun. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> cool. Uh, so, and uh, Stephen, what about you? What, what, what happened during 20... I mean, we I, I looked at the social media and a lot of things happened for you on, you, on your side. So it would be interesting to see... <laughs> If you had just to summarize 2023 in three sentences, what would it be? Well, for me or for uh, SRE, which is the kind of field I've been working in? Or, uh, I would say uh, for, for you in general, what would you achieve? Yeah. And, and, and... yeah, it's been an interesting year. So obviously two and a half years ago, that's when I stopped working as a performance engineer. And then I spent a year and a half uh, as a SRE in like an enablement team. But this year, up until a few weeks ago, I was working as a developer advocate. So my whole job was to run my podcast, Slight Reliability, to go to events, to write articles, and just talk to people in the community and get information. So this year for me has been about hearing all the cool things that other people are doing around the world, but not getting to do them. So lots of talking about really cool ideas, and it got to a point where I felt like I was missing out. And so I've gone back into the industry to... Uh, to get my hands dirty and do some work and hopefully make a difference. I yes, hope that you, get, you you were able to get some some miles some uh, for your with your um, best uh, fly uh, fly <laughs> a fly uh, uh, air, uh, fly company and and hotels and so on. I, I hope that you had that at least had that uh, as an. Uh, I actually only a, had two it, trips overseas. So there was reinvent in well, Vegas at the end yeah. of twenty twenty two, which was. Obviously, I've never been to anything like that before. Just so many people. We had a, a booth at Squid Up where I, where I worked and I helped man the booth. Uh, honestly, though, if it's a conference for me to go and learn from, I didn't really appreciate it and I, do, I wouldn't choose to go there to, to learn stuff. It's just very product driven uh, and just too big to get around. I prefer more community focused events. Uh, and the other trip was uh, Squid Up has a, has a conference every year. The, the whole company comes together in the UK. So I went to, flew to the UK and did that. I also went to AWS uh, Summit in London. And then on the way home, I spoke at uh, SRECon in Singapore, which was, that's the, probably the highlight of my year, I think. Uh, yeah. That's cool. Yeah. And uh, so you've never been to, had a chance to go to, to KubeCon? Because in fact, this year at KubeCon North America, I said, oh, I'm going to go to Square Up. Because you, you didn't do, do the announcement at that time. I said, maybe Steven is there. So I, I was chasing or looking for after the Square Up booth. But uh, honestly, I've, I've been probably disrupted by something. Coffee <laughs> or, or beer, I don't know. Uh, in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to go to a QCon. That's that's right up my alley. I think it's the, the perfect event for me. Yeah, it's... it's that's, question, uh, are you planning to go to any for next year? Not at the moment. I've just taken a new role uh, at IAG, actually, the, the big insurance company that I used to work for. And I, I, I've got a very big, busy role. I'm an environments, an environments manager now. Uh, and so I don't know uh, exactly how much time I'll have for events, but I'd love to go. Yeah. So what is an environments variable, uh, var, uh, manager? What does that mean? I'm still figuring that out. I'm still defining it. But basically, uh, there's some very large programs of work and to deliver those, we need uh, test environments, right? Big, sometimes big integrated, complicated test environments as complicated as production. Uh, my job is to make sure those environments are reliable. They're up and they're running and there's a good incident management process. There's good observability, all those good things. There's also a coordination part to that as well. But uh, I, 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 my, the bit that I'm excited about is applying reliability concepts in that context and following it through to production. Cool. So Leandro, well, what about you? What, what was the 2023? What, what happened for you in 2023 then? Oh, well, uh, for me, 2023 was an interesting um, transition. As many of you may know, for the ones that don't, I'm a DevRel um, with Grafana K6 and 
2022 was full K6, was nothing else, and just like the performance realm where I was used to and kind of kind of knowledgeable um, with all these new technologies and distributed and open source and promoting it. But 2023 <clears throat> started a transition where, first of all, uh, K6 was uh, integrated inside of the Grafana platform, which got me into uh, a big oh maelstrom that I had to start to grab on new concepts and things that I knew in essence from afar. Docker, Kubernetes, really, really do Git, and not only Git, but GitHub with all the social network elements that it has, which was a bit uh, overwhelming, I have to say, because for the ones that do not know, uh, in the testing community, just pure testing, it's very rare that we, ta we touch a Docker container, that we touch a uh, Kubernetes clusters, or uh, even in some levels, you never, now I say it is scandalized, you never um, have a, a repository for <laughs> your test automations or things like that. And especially with some of the tools that uh, are or were out there, like imagine having like, a, I don't know, your UFT automations in a repository that would be a little bit <laughs> messy. I don't think those tools are designed to be managed in those ways. Uh, or, well, they can, but I don't think the sanity will be very good of the people trying to manage all that. So it, it started to be, be an interesting experience and integrating everything with uh, the Grafana solutions and getting into logs and metrics and traces. And now with this new thing that, uh, what was the name? Profiles, like... Okay, uh, what's the difference like a, 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 a flame graph with a profile and what is going on on here? Um, it has been pretty interesting and I cannot say I'm done with that, that 2023 is over. This all is going to permeate in uh, 2024. I got to polish and understand and play with a lot of things around it. The blast, not blast. I think Henrik, you and I already played a little bit and talked about open telemetry a while ago in Perfights. But now it's ramping up. That's the other one where I'm like, oh, wow, okay. Um, it's becoming the standard. It's making it a, making things easier and integrating with so many other things, the open telemetry modules and functionalities uh, has been interesting. It's been quite a year. Um, Together with some personal things, for the ones that uh, do not know, I got married this year, so it was an interesting year <laughs> <laughs> having all that in between. So uh, I think that um, that also took a little bit of attention last year uh, from my learning path. So it was very interesting. And <clears throat> aside of uh, getting married on the technological and performance side, it opened my eyes on how much it's the performance practice is actually moving. The performance testing is not only performance testing, is not only scripting. I think the job role will start, if it's not already, like changing a lot, because I don't see it as much as it was before, like uh, you're a performance tester, you come and you automate all these process, 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 then I do a big ass slow test, the bolt, try to bring down things. Now it's very different. and. You have observability, you have browser, uh, real user monitoring, you can detect things. Networking uh, tab, no, the developer tab on your browsers also, people are getting used to look at that a little bit more, or probably that's what I hope. <laughs> Can I ask a question? Because so, sure. a, a couple of years ago, when I was doing performance engineering still, honestly, not 90, 95 out of 100 performance testers that I would meet would pretty much mostly just be making scripts in JMeter or Load Runner and running them. And there was not a lot of value being added. And has that really changed or is it just that we're being exposed, we're in the sort of circles now, where we're being exposed to people doing other kinds of stuff? I don't really know if things have changed, but I think what the mark, what the, the technology uh, around us now with, with observability extended and having more visibility and I think uh, having open temperature as a standard is exciting because it, there's all, we, we have no all the keys to 
automate things, to make smart decisions, to, I think it's, it's very exciting. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if most of the test tester or performance engineers are actually using those layers, but I think now there is so much, I mean, power out there. Uh, so if they were able to take it, they will be just uh, the lord of the load, uh, lord of the, oh, I don't know, something, <laughs> something like this. <laughs> no, and to, and to your point, Stephen, I do agree, like a few years ago, it was like 95, 90% of the people following those processes. I'm not saying everyone has converted that, but probably mm. today is 70, 60% of people still doing those uh, all-time processes. But as Hendrik says, I think technology, tools, uh, projects, I still walk into teams that have like, yeah, I need a staging environment or a pre pro environment so that I can run my load tests every sprint, uh, the old but ways the, and trying to do those things. One simple thing that just to illustrate this is that, except of K6, who did a few years back an X, XK6 distributed tracing plugin where you were able to start a trace from a load testing perspective. I mean, I was saying, oh, all the, all the market, all the vendors of the market will pick it up. And when you launch launch test, every single virtual users or whatever Selenium test, or uh, they will generate uh, open temperature traces. I know that uh, uh, Roger uh, for um, Abstracta did a plugin for Selenium, so now they are starting also uh, uh, distribute traces from uh, from Selenium. But I was really sure last year, uh, a year from now. Exactly. Just after we say, oh, the mar the testing market will be so smart that right. will all will do that because it will so much it will bring so much value for the testing ap approach. And then one year later, if I look around and I look at the readme files from the last releases and I say, what? Come on, yeah, guys. <laughs> what is happening? I don't know, but but uh, something <laughs> needs to change. Needs to change. Yeah, yeah. yeah the, I think the also. As more companies migrate and get to the cloud and get to um, microservice architectures and start to understand and see these needs, and especially when they see the cloud bills when they do those big as low tests just because every uh, sprint and things like that, I've seen organizations that things are clicking and even as if they want to keep doing the things the old way and just script, 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 things are evolving and uh, one intended, the performance engineer doesn't want to be the bottleneck at the end of the sprint and like, wait, 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 I need a frozen environment. I need to run this big slow test. And I see more people like clicking and saying like, ah, so this is how I can go on time in the second Friday of the sprint to go home and rest without like trying to bring down the system. Um, with something that we just released something small or uh, that it was just like a microservice that I had to just test and check that it was doing fine. I'm not saying don't do big as low tests anymore. There, there are always Taylor Swift out there. Well, yeah, I was going to say like, yes, if you've got microservices and they're decoupled to a point where you can test them independently, that's great. But like, I, I would posit a guess that the majority of organizations in the world, like banks and insurance companies and government departments, they don't. They have these tightly coupled, complicated architectures. And in that case, I would say to anyone out there, go ahead and do a big big bang end-to-end -end performance test if you have to, because you might not be able to break it up effectively. You might be able to do lots of stuff as well to support that, to get some earlier information. But but, 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 but you say that if you have to, not on a continuous sprint and on a continuous basis, you already yeah. know that it survives. You already know those situations. And yeah. I think that's that's a problem that many organizations have got into agile and continuous CICDs. But, uh, like, oh, yeah, CICD load testing every time. Well, let's try to bring down the system. Why? Unless you really have like a good reason, Black Friday or these things. Yeah. I, 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 re recently, I organized the, uh, uh, I mean, I launched, by the way, uh, Perf, uh, Perf Bytes Francais. So if you if you know how to talk to speech, uh, I mean, if you want to learn French and you don't know how <laughs> to start, I think the best way is to start listening for performance engineer talks in French. Uh, that's the best way of learning French. But uh, no, so I had Carrefour, Carrefour made a meetup and he explained what they do. So they were doing continuous testing. And what surprised me, as, so they were doing some few big banks tests, but they were mainly focused on regression. 
And the way they were doing, they were invest. I mean, how, I don't know how much time they're building it. They are grabbing all the results back and then they're putting an AI model in terms of that. So the AI model is basically cross crawling the metrics and then figuring out uh, the weakness uh, points. And then, so then they open a tickets with what the AI has identified. And, I th- and when I looked at it, I said, wow. And I said, that's, that's pretty exciting. I said, okay, Sorry. so this is a project we're running on, but what will be the cost to onboard a new project on this on this approach? Because I get pretty sure that the algorithm is pretty much very specific to the scope of the project. But they say, no, it's not so expensive. Um, so, but the, cl- the answer was not answered. But I think now with, with not only just uh, observability and, uh, and, sons and things, we have so much component like AI uh, that could come in the picture and help and to be more efficient as well. So this is also a component. And I, I know that Stephen wanted to, to touch base on that topic as well. On the observability or open telemetry, Area, on the, gen, the gen AI, or AI. <laughs> yes, I yeah. So I obviously performance engineering. Yep, that that was my life for a long time. Then SRE became this hot buzzword, and everyone was like, "Yeah, site reliability, fantastic." And then Gen IA came along, and no one talks about SRE anymore. <laughs> it's like it's just drowned everything out. And honestly, a lot of the stuff out there is just garbage. Honestly, it's just not adding a lot of value. I think the best thing that Gen IA can offer to the world. Is it, it creates fantastic uh, artwork if you're running a D&D campaign and you want to like <laughs> concept some ideas about different dungeons and creatures and things. That's the best thing GNIA has brought to the world, in my opinion. I'm not saying it doesn't have any value, but I think the hype is way beyond the capability. Well, uh, well yeah, I, I, I have to add to my 2023 that I started to use a lot of um, these generative AI, this AI stuff, um, not to get solutions, but uh, just to give you um, context, I was um, stuck and didn't understand why my Docker file was not doing the thing that I wanted to generate, like a test environment, like a framework that I could use. And I was like, hey, uh, ChatGPT, um, mind explaining what's wrong with my Docker file? And pointed out, they didn't give me exactly the solution. And it was clunky in details, but sent me to the right ways to kind of learn and understand. And my Docker file is now up running, and I learned so much from that experience, which I have to say it has some good applications. Even like helped me with a couple of case scripts uh, dealing with a couple of things that I honestly was lazy to kind of create a correlation by hand. But I was like, this is my uh, regular expression. Please figure out the uh, something case six. Okay, the code that it brought wasn't the best. I just had to tweak it a little bit. But it made a difference. It made my life easier on a couple of things that I have to say it, it's relevant. I, 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 I mainly use it for, for figuring out which hashtag I should put to the videos uh, or, <laughs> or, or ma- make a promotion text more, and more nicer. I, but I, I never use it for or something else. <clears throat> I have the same experience as Leandro. For me, when, when I started with Kubernetes and I, I'm not like an expert and there are so much, so much to learn about it and so much information. And uh, then I just uh, used uh, a prompt to what is happening? What is this? Just to, to make an approach to it. And th- then just to figure out a bit, like uh, who do I need to talk to? <laughs> Uh, to the Dapper guy, to the Linkerd guy, to the, what? What is this? What is happening? Is the service mesh? It's uh, something else. What? What is happening here? Uh, and that's the way I, I, I approach to to AI, just to help me instead of putting it and uh, let uh, a, a Stack Overflow, um, a Stack Overflow, just to to answer something, just to put it in the and chat GPT or whatever, and just get an answer from there, just to have all the information. So, like, so, so scope. Did, did... Did the answer work and did you reach out to the Dapper team uh, because it was a service mesh uh, issue or was it? <laughs> actually, no, actually, I, 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 at, at least I figured out what was the problem and I, I knew how to approach it and then who to, to work with. Like it cool. was a network problem in that case. Uh, so it was Linkerd and service mesh. Uh, but it, it, and not only for that, for, for K6 uh, scripts as well sometimes and uh, uh, to build something really fast, it, it helped me a bit. But um, for me, it's like all the information, it's uh, like gathered. You don't ha- If you don't know what you don't know, mm. <laughs> you just have questions. You just can prompt and prompt and prompt. And uh, in the end, maybe you have something like they're like, ah, okay, I can cling to this and just can 
use it somewhere else and just ask the the, the person that knows what is happening. But um, mm -hmm. that's how, how, how I approach to it. So, that's an interesting because for me as well, it's not like it gives you the answer, but guides you towards that you can figure it out yourself afterwards and gives you some good indications. In my experience, it almost never gives you like the right thing uh, yeah. at, the, at the first time or ever. But it's like, oh, huh, if, if you add your own thought on the process and what ChatGPT is giving you, it's like, yeah, okay, thank you. I can, uh, oh yeah, this with this and that that you, we were mentioning. And it's an actual silly conversation where <laughs> it's, 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 it's like a fortune teller, ChatGPT, from you. Oh, you, you got to go to the closet next to the exit. And I'm like, oh, I found it here. Cool. Thank you. So, <laughs> no. I think it was the um, Catchpoint 2023 study of SRE report. It talked about how across, you know, it did a bunch of analysis of SRE and where AI is providing value. And it was saying, basically, it's not providing a lot of value, except in two areas that I thought was getting a lot of value, which was anomaly detection and observability. And uh, I forgot the name of the thing. It's when there's a whole bunch of like in, like uh, errors occurring in a solution and it pulls them together in a single incident, you know, it consolidates lots of issues and errors across a relation. Or, yeah, it correlates them together into one incident. Yeah. So that's super helpful as well. So I buy that. I think that's, uh, that's a great use case. So uh, something we didn't touch base and uh, was really interesting to get uh your uh, your opinion but so you you did the transitioning from performance engineer to sre so tell us about that journey how did you uh, did you when you put the suits did you feel that oh uh, I, I have so i need to to add some shoulders because something is missing here or was it you were comfortable you were relaxed and you said oh uh, it's too it's too easy now I, i'm i'm relaxed uh I think I was a, in a unique position. One, as a performance engineer, from a personal perspective, I was in a very extremely stressful project and I burnt out and I just, I needed a change. And this opportunity came up and I just jumped on it, right? Uh, the SRE work that I did was unique and that I wasn't on call in production, just like, you know, solving, fighting fires all day. I was in a small team and our job was to take SRE concepts and build tools to help other t teams in the company. So the pressure wasn't really on and we got to play around with a bunch of cool stuff. That's where I've, I learned Kubernetes and during that experience and many other tools and technologies. Uh, and we did provide a lot of value, I think, around the observability space. Uh, and so that, yeah, that was quite easy for me. I, I wasn't, I learned a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, I really enjoyed the greater breadth of thing, of influence and impact that I was able to, to make in that space. Because it, I think performance engineering is amazing. But in some situations, in the, in the wrong team, in the wrong company, you kind of get put in this little box, you run load tests, that's what you do, just do that. And you don't really feel like, but what about this and this and all the other things that need, you know, the reason it's not performing well and we could do this instead. It's, no, 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 you run tests in JMeter, go and do that. So, so, Whereas so, so. SRE, the door's opened, <laughs> I have to say. I've been there so many times, it's so frustrating. Uh, uh, literally, you're put in the box and uh, you, you you cannot play elsewhere, and and so many elements. When you when you were telling that story, I remember another company that I was working at. I so badly wanted to access Dynatrace to see the performance metrics. Of, no 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 no, that's for SREs. That's for the operation guys. You just do your load test. Like I'm a performance engineer. I'm trying to look at this metric. No no no, that's for SREs. Don't want. We won't give you any login or anything to that. I'm, it's just. Why? You're too young to that. You're too young. You're a kid. <laughs> go, back, go back and play with your Legos. <laughs> I, I, was <laughs> I, I was lucky because I was the first one to arrive. So the company started like uh, the, the, the year that I arrived to the company. So uh, I was like the first DevOps <laughs> in the company, like a performance engineer. Like, uh, okay, we have to grow. What uh, do we hire? Do, do we hire a performance engineer? Okay. Uh, and I, I, I remember my, my CTO saying like, uh, we have to build a DevOps team. I said, no, DevOps is a culture. It's, it's not a team. It's what are you saying? Uh, let's build an SRE uh, team. And I was the one in charge of building the SRE team. And in, in the end, I ended being in the SRE team. I'm not only the performer. So I, I, I was having, no, I still have everything, all the, all the keys, all the logins, everything. And, uh, I was lucky there because I, I, I was able to move like while building the team 
um, like uh, naturally. So I, in the end, we we built a SRE team on top of the performance engineer team. So it, it was amazing. It was an amazing trip. We so, lost you so you extended at the end uh, the uh, what you're able to do. Uh, so you, it's not only non-production. You were covering non-production and production. So at the end, it's a it's a superhero team, I would say. Yeah, but uh, I was in, in like what what was uh, Stephen was saying that uh, he wasn't in the in the on call duty and he was not in production. I was in production <laughs> when we were like uh, facing all the issues and all the fires and all the outages uh, in the, at the start of the in, the in the beginning of the of the application when to, we were starting to grow and uh, we were like from this monolith starting to build the microservices like from the POC to <laughs> to a proper product. Um, as a performance engineer, you learn all the flows, you learn all the infrastructure, you have the 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 capacity, the, the, the capability of, of learning everything. So we can build uh, on top of that, of that knowledge, you build observability, and you build the incident management, you build the alerting, you build everything on top of that. So you discover what is missing, and then you add yeah. what is missing to, to to make it more reliable at the end. So yeah, yeah agree, so agree. that's an interesting um, position because you had the flexibility to kind of mutate into or extend into other roles. Or is it DevOps? Is it SRE? Uh, what the hell is Almudena in this organization? Or what's her? And I know that you even had to come up with your uh, fun uh, job role position, bring ops and things like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting problem for organizations because they don't know, they kind of need to label the roles of the people and say, okay, we are going to allow them to do this, this, and that. And, and it's weird because an organization doesn't like this crazy engineer just running all over the place, whatever they want. But, How but, will that... But I think it's super exciting to to hear that a company that, uh, Lidl, Lidl that allowed that, right? Ah, uh, yeah, because at the end, I would say that if you are a performance engineer and you want to learn things and do things, I mean, Lidl seems a very crazy company. You should go there. I don't know if good you're, crazy, you're looking crazy. for people. <laughs> 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 no, I, mean, I mean, it's super exciting because at, at the end, you, you can really, if you want, you're up to learning things and and just increase your, your technical skills. This is just the perfect place. I mean, from what you're saying, it seems very... In, in, yeah, very... I was lucky because we started in 2019, like with all the the applications, the mobile applications, that was the start. So that was the beginning that we were like a team of 50 people, like products basically. And uh, they just, uh, all, everything, like all the engineering team was like, uh, uh, how do you call it? When the over... Uh, uh, body source like uh, to another company subrogated to something to outsourcing outsourced so, yeah. also all the engineering team was outsourced at that point and we started building we we, we got a POC of uh, one I think it was 100,000 people to stores and now we have eight, 90 million people 90 million users customers and uh, next year we will have 20 million more from Kaufland and uh, 50 million more from the state. So we are growing and we learn while we are growing. You start, so you 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 realize what you need when you you face a problem that, okay, I, I need this part. Like for now, for my challenge in 2000, 2024, uh, it will be like what we started in 2023, that it was open telemetry. I'm building a platform engineering team because we saw that it was, we were overwhelmed. We have the verticals, we have our products. Yeah, you cannot do everything. You cannot build also the environment as well. So we, we started to build a team like an, in the end of, uh, of this year. So like uh, uh, in, uh, after summer, we started to build a platform engineer and we so, were so like tell, giving tell them us about, stuff. Tell us about what's your approach about platform engineering because there is many different ways of doing it. I mean, I mean different way. Are you relying on different specific solutions? What what? How would you interact with the platform engineers as a performance engineer? So, if, for example, oh, I need to do, and you mentioned K6 and the K6 operator. How, how does it work? Do you do do you reach out to the platform engineer and they're provisioning you like a cluster, and then you right have the now, operator there? The team is not mature enough, so we do the other way around. So that we we say we arouse a problem and we say, okay, we need open telemetry or we need a K6 operator. Okay, uh, which vertical is a Got more free time to do it. I do it. I'm. 
Okay, I'm trying to do this. <laughs> we can do it. Uh, so the vertical just uh, covers their necessities. And then we just, uh, we, do, we run the POC, we run something that, it's, uh, that, that, that works, but maybe that is not productible. So you cannot just like uh, industrialize it. So we, we, we give the POC and uh, we give it to the platform team. So they cover the necessities of the other verticals, but okay. uh, we got it working already. And then they standardized it. That's the way we are working right now. So, and, and we'll, we'll be interesting to see what, what type of a because the, there is a lot of various way of, of structuring the the platform engineering team. So, what type of profile uh, you're looking for? Is it more, uh, I would say, uh, like more like a ops Kubernetes operator uh, profile yeah. with a security background as well, or, or how we what, have what a DevSecOps, of course. Uh, we have the the SRE, two SREs. DevSecOps, um, and we have as well the, the the guys from mobile, just building um, building libraries for the mobile SDKs for the mobile applications, uh, and I think uh, we have as well a couple of backenders just to build libraries for uh, for for the backend. So we have it's like a like a normal like a regular uh, product team, but focusing focusing on the necessities of the other products yep. so but we have everything a qa po <laughs> uh so automation qa that is building libraries or frameworks for the other qas we have the backenders we have the mobile guys we have the SREs. it's a completely full product team but focusing on on the products for for the other teams but uh so you mentioned something interesting was uh, the open telemetry aspects yeah. Uh, so, so how how are you, uh, so you you actually investing in it? So how how do you use Open Telemetry? I mean, are you using it mainly for production use cases, or are you starting to use as well for the performance engineering uh, practice? Right now, we are only using it for production environment. Uh, of course, we test it before in in performance, but um, uh, we are using it for for production. Uh, we wanted to move it actually. As a matter of fact, we will run in a performance. So, so we were discussing like last week, uh, what we are going to do with the tenant of performance. If we were, uh, how we deal with a quote and that kind of stuff, because it was like, if everyone wants to run performance tests at the same time, um, um, so it's going to be a hell and, uh, we are going to run out of quote. Uh, but at the moment we are only running for production. Okay. Expected next year to run it for all, not only performance test environment, but, but for, all for the, dev, everything dev, for dev, for UAT, for everything. Okay. Um, yeah. So that, that's that's a good transitioning because we we want to talk touch base on we we talked about a lot of things about twenty twenty three, but what about twenty four twenty twenty four? So so are you going to that's the main goal for for you on your side? Utilize the observability data as much as possible to uh, shift it and take it value out of that uh, in the dev processes, QA processes, and of course, part production. Is this one your, one, one of your main objectives for yep. 2024? Okay. Our objective for 2024 is just to, um, to make profit out of all the monitoring systems. Like, uh, uh, I think that I was talking to Leandro the other day that uh, we are like, we, we are overwhelmed by the quantity the number of metrics that we have. So uh, now we have to value the quality of the metric. That's our main goal for next year. And quantity we, is easy in terms of metrics, right? It is right? easy, but uh, we were like uh, having problems with Thanos and Prometheus. So we were like everything going down and right out of space. But uh, so we want to focus now on the quality of the metric and the quality of the logs and the quality of the traces. And from that, Building a really observability uh, observability um, product or system or platform to provide us with really good feedback. It's not only to have a lot of metrics, but those that provides good good measurements for for your product, and that taken uh, um, that everywhere, not only in production. That is the main goal to have it in production, but to have it everywhere, like uh, to have beta alerting. If you are running your load tests and you have a, you have a good 
um, idea of what is going to happen in production or your case testing and uh, you know what is going to happen to uh, from the observability part to take that to to take that to production. So I think that's the main goal and to uh, build um, so the maturity of the platform team. Okay. I, I, I don't know. I, I saw Steven going back and forth. Yeah. Uh, he, I don't know if he's, uh, he's, he's back. Ow! Are you fine, Amigo yeah. Steven? <laughs> no, we cannot hear you. Um, I've got a fan okay. going. Back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> turned, I've turned up the, the fan on my computer and I've got a fan blowing next to me. If, if it's noisy, let me know. No, oh, no, no, it's perfectly no. fine. <laughs> so, so Stephen, we we we, we talked about we, we talked a lot about 2023, and uh, Almunenda just shared uh, her plans for 2024, moving more, yeah. utilizing more and more uh, observability in other environments, but also uh, trying to uh, select uh, good uh, metri metrics and not uh, having been flooded by data, but just uh, targeting the good data point that you need. What about you? What what is the main uh, um, object or what, what are you targeting for 2024? I, what am I targeting? Uh, I am, I'm already sort of branching out away from just the reliability space into more of a broader DevOps sense. So right. when you're looking at environments and big programs of work and lots of teams and computer complicated systems, you start thinking about other things like, hey, how are we going to have to have too many environments if we don't do trunk based development and our how our code branching strategy suddenly impacts our ability to deliver this and hey, that's going to cost a lot of money or it's going to be too complicated. So I'm, I'm just thinking about a whole bunch of uh, different ideas. Uh, and I think the, my, the podcast is probably going to change as, as a result of that and, and kind of go into a, a broader, nice. a broader sort of view as it were. So not focus yeah. only on, on, on SRE aspects, more uh, platform. So, oh, so you, you're you're going to the route of platform engineering slash SREs uh, podcast or something like this, or tell us about more. Is it yeah, gonna DevOps be now like platforming or something like that? Yeah. <laughs> well, I changed the name once. It used to be called Performance Time when it was about performance engineering. So yeah. you never know. No. <laughs> I think I think SRE is still the, the core of it, but uh, it's just because of the nature of my role. If, if there are questions that come up. Because I think that's what's interesting, right? If, if there's real specific problems and you want to talk about them, that's interesting. Uh, the kind of stuff I like to listen to anyway. Okay. And Leandro, what about you? 2024, what, 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 what was the goal? What's your goal? So uh, 2024, now that we don't have uh, personal engagements and things uh, to take care of, uh, it's going to be a lot of... Uh, similar to what Stephen already did, like uh, observability, I really look forward to get uh, and explain and produce more content. Uh, I mean, much more perfites than last year, for sure, right, Henrik? <laughs> um, perfites 2024 in Espanol, uh, Francais, and uh, the main show that you're watching right now. I think it's going to be uh, packed and more active. But as well, more, more videos, more Thanks. YouTube, more explanations on uh, logs, metrics, uh, traces, whatever profiles are now that uh, once I figured that out. Um, more open telemetry. I look forward to kick that thing as much as possible because the possibilities, uh, some things that I have been like cooking and uh, finding, as you were mentioning earlier, to have observability on some Selenium or Playwright or Cypress, you can have open the open telemetry um, libraries in a test automation and the possibilities there are as well incredible. I, I not only want to know uh, to observe the tested system, but to observe the automations and the test cycles. I think that will be very interesting to mix up in a big, big platform. I, I look forward to uh, getting more and mixing all those possibilities and create something crazy. Let's see. Okay, cool. Awesome. How about you? So, oh, my end. Uh, oh, I, uh, it's going to be, uh, again, a lot of uh, content to produce, uh, a lot of videos. Uh, and uh, my main goal is to have fun. Uh, if I don't have fun, then uh, it's going to be, I, I, I want to have the creativity uh, to, uh, to build stuff and share things. So, uh, yeah, my main, I think my main goal is to have fun. And 
uh, not getting getting not getting bored and learn things and share things that's that's going to be uh, and of course uh, mainly on observability i'm going to try to target more and more uh, in, because i think security is uh, is a pillar indirectly to observability so uh, how do you utilize more and more security data um and uh yeah i'm i'm, I'm just starting <laughs> continue on that direction so i'm re reshaping a bit the episode i do on is it observable to make it shorter um and split the content instead of a, having a big 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 episode uh trying to re repurpose the content in smaller episode uh but yeah, that's when just improvement on, on the channel but yeah that's my my objective have fun 2024 is going to be uh, the fun year for me i hope so cross the fingers <laughs> Um, when you asked me before, I, I just came back after the dis disconnections. And my, yeah, my brain wasn't quite out of it. But there's two more things that I, for this year I'm going to focus on that I wanted to mention. Uh, one of them is that I've got a reasonably high profile role where there's going to be a lot of pressure. So one of my challenges is how do I enjoy myself under that pressure still and not take it too seriously? That's one thing. I'm turning 40 in a, a month's time, and I I've decided the next 40 years are not going to be as, I'm not going to take it as seriously. This is the first 40. Uh, <laughs> and the other thing is uh, I work in a big complex organization and I, I really want to work on my ability to, to communicate the value of the work that we're all talking about to executives and leadership uh, in a way which actually gets buy-in. I think it's really challenging, especially right now. It's super important, I think, because, you know, because the economy, companies are like, well, I justify everything you do. And, and so I want to get better at that. Yeah. One of my goals and challenges for this year as well is to contribute to the community. I mean, contribute to open way source. More? Way more. <laughs> to, uh, there are a lot of, of, of interesting projects out there. A lot of them that you can contribute. So I have a project if you want to contribute on that. And you were talking about observability and <laughs> open telemetry and, and everything. <laughs> And and one of them is is we are only all everyone is focused only on one thing producing observability data, yeah. And yeah. Uh, trace test is was the one that says let's utilize it to test to validate something. And I am I may very com convinced that now that we have a structured format, the same payload, the same attributes, everything that we expect, what don't we extract and we analyze and figure out what should be tested, and what uh, what things we should pay attention based on existing traces. This is something I, I, I was working on uh, um, prior to my uh, role in Dynatrace uh, with a uh, different format of data. And I'm really convinced that open telemetry is the key because we have a structured and unified format. So then we can do that analysis, whatever, independent of the tool. And then we can reuse it if we use a whatever, Dynatrace, New Relic, uh, honeycomb we have the structured data so we can analyze that data without rebuilding a new tool contribute i think that this has the community just to give it back to the community because um, we are like yeah. seniors right or we try to to give back to the community to spread the word of performance engineering and the sre and uh i would like to do that so come in yeah. <laughs> Oh, oh, and go to my first um, KubeCon. That's that's a big one for me. I haven't been in any KubeCon. That's I sorry, will look forward. Will you, will you be in Paris? So Paris? So, so I hope so. Cool. Just, yeah. cool. So I will be there. So uh, let's have fun then there. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If anyone is around, I hope to see you there. Uh, it's not not for sure yet, but big probability. Stay <laughs> mm. tuned. Chan, chan, we will chan. put some velas. <laughs> we will <laughs> do a par by, we will do a par by français then in, in Paris. It should be. Oh no, in the near par de wall. Perfect Catalan, I told you. So then that I can do. <laughs> yeah. All right. So I think we we covered a lot of things. Uh, and uh, first, thank you, Stephen, for showing up. Um, I mean, you're taking the time to put some pants and between the, the pool and uh, the barbecue and just do some podcasting. I really appreciate that. That was nice for, for, from your side. Who says he's wearing pants? 
I don't no, know. You don't know, Wing Pants. <laughs> you have no idea what's going on down here. <laughs> down under. Down under. Okay. Maybe we don't want to know either. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it was an, just a pleasure to be here and have the conversation. I, I gutted I dropped off because there are things I wanted to talk about. We didn't get there, but, you know, maybe we can have another episode next year. We can do There's a... Always. Like a we can do the first, uh, the, the twenty-four, uh, the first episode of the year could be also. So, in this case, oh. do that. Sure. All right. Uh, thanks, Almu. It was uh, awesome to get your feedback. Uh, I will always love uh, you. Always have great stories, and uh, especially what you're doing at uh, in Lidl is just uh, fantastic. So, thanks for sharing this. Thank you. It's an honor. It's a pleasure to be here with you and uh, all of you. <laughs> so, hopefully, we will see we will see each other again in KubeCon Paris. Uh, in Las Vegas, at least. Ah, in Las Vegas. With Las Vegas. Oh, yeah, yeah but that's the other one. won't be in Las Vegas, but with, uh, wow. uh, with Eric, uh, I will be there in Las Vegas, just uh, broadcasting a bit, right? Yeah. Yep, completely. You two will and have to do some tour fights from there. We will and... try to do, yeah. But, I mean, uh, I just can change the endpoint uh, for a few. Uh, we can do that. I will do, definitely. Yeah. With uh, Mark, because Mark is there, of course. Yeah, right. And uh, Leandro, enjoy your, your time in uh, Portugal. Uh, and in uh, I guess you, you're heading to Germany just after that, no? Just arrived in Berlin, so it's going to oh, be... Oh, I thought you were still in Portugal, okay. No, no, no. <laughs> Look at yeah. the grey window outside. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's yeah. Germany. <laughs> they should be better in Berlin, yeah. Uh, <laughs> thank all you. Right. All. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Uh, happy Christmas to everyone. Happy uh, end of the year. And see you next year for another Perf Park episode. See you. Hola, fiesta. Happy holidays. Feliz Navidad. Felices fiestas. Uh, Joy Noel. Of France. Joy Noel. Joy Noel. <laughs> A good Jule. Bye. 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 Bye.